So several months ago, Pastor Heidi, Pastor Eric, and I were talking about um, worship planning for the summer se season, and we were trying to decide if we should preach a couple different sermon series, and we had decided to preach a sermon series on the book of Ephesians. And after reading that gospel message about the beheading of John the Baptist, I'm so glad we did. I don't have to preach on the beheading of John the Baptist, and I dodged a bullet on that one. So let me know if any of these words sound familiar. Prejudice, distrust, judgment, self-centeredness, demonization of others, a sense of superiority, fear of those who are different, divisiveness, violent rhetoric, all your heads are nodding. I mean, it's exactly what's going on in our country today. But those same words could have applied to the communities in and around Ephesus in the first century, in fact, around the world throughout all of history. Human behavior, it seems, is often very far removed from God's intended ideal state for all of us. This morning, we're beginning a four-week sermon series we're calling No Longer Strangers, based upon the letter to the Ephesians. And in that letter, the writer reminds us that the new Christian communities that are, quote, now in Christ Jesus are no longer strangers to God. And equally as important, they're no longer strangers and alienated from each other. Because of Christ, they are now living in new and different community. And that community and our community today will be the focus of our journey over these next four weeks. And God's community includes everyone. Everyone is a beloved child of God. No one, friends, is a stranger in God's community. And as I mentioned, in tandem with our preaching series, our summer book group will be reading and discussing Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together book, which is all about his reflections of Christian community during his time at the Finkenworld Seminary in pre-World War II Germany. It's a seminary he and others started as the Nazis were rising in power and corrupting the church and beginning their destructive reign. So if you're interested, I encourage you to join us on Tuesday morning. Before we move forward on our journey this morning through Ephesians, I'd like to give a bit of background to the letter just to clarify a few things and make sure we're all on the same page. Although this letter is often attributed to the Apostle Paul, most modern biblical scholars now believe that somebody other than Paul wrote the letter. The language and style in Ephesians differs from that in the seven genuine Pauline letters. And additionally, the letter seems to imply that the audience of the letter does not know Paul, which is very different from Paul's other letters in which highlight a familiar and very personal relationship with his audience. So for these and several other reasons, most scholars today refer to this as a Deutero-Pauline letter, meaning secondary. And it may have been written by one of Paul's students or one of Paul's followers. And another important thing that I'd like to touch on this morning is how we read it, and it's specifically how we read the word you, Y-O-U, in the letter. And with the exception of Paul's letter to Philemon, all of his letters, as well as all of the other Deutero-Pauline letters in the Bible, are addressed to entire communities, not just individuals. And unfortunately, our English language doesn't have a plural for the word you. We just say you, and you have to figure out from the context whether it's singular or plural as opposed to the original Greek, or even in Spanish, where we have usted and ustedes. It makes it much easier. So my suggestion is, when you read it, when you read the word you, read it as plural. 
not singular. Read it as y'all. Or, as a good, good friend of mine who grew up in the South points out, the plural of y'all is all y'all. So going along those lines of the importance of how you read the word you, over time, especially in many of the more conservative evangelical churches, the emphasis has been on developing a personal relationship with Jesus as a means of salvation. The, de the focus is on developing your own individual faith, and they don't talk much about a communal faith. The community in that gets lost, and a lot of that can be attributed to how they read the word you. So as a reminder, the focus of Jesus' entire ministry on earth was done in and through community. Paul's letters were addressed to entire communities of faith, not individuals. So when you read the Bible, always read it through the lens of community. Read it as, the speak, as though the speakers are talking to all y'all. Or, as one of my professors used to say, there are no soloists in the Christian choir. Community is the focus of the letter to the Ephesians. A community where Gentiles are welcomed into the family where Jews had belonged since the beginning. A community where diverse people with diverse gifts all work together to build the kingdom of God on earth. A community where God has called and welcomed everyone in Christ. In other words, a community worthy of the gospel. This morning's reading from Ephesians is just beautiful, full of blessings, full of praise, full of grace. As one of the commentaries I read says, it sings rather than discusses. It praises rather than tells. It plunges us into a cascade of beauty and riches. Today's reading lavishes praise upon God for creating us, for loving us, and for redeeming us. Just listen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Friends, if you're ever having one of those days where you're down and having trouble finding even small amounts of joy in the daily struggles of life, we all have those. I encourage you to take a few minutes and just read the first chapter of Ephesians. Nothing else. Just read that. You can't help but be moved and grateful by the blessings of God. It's an endless stream of praise and grace that carries us right up to God's presence. And as you're reading it, take note. We're told that all of this was done for God's own pleasure, not for ours. God chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. And friends, not only did God choose us, he designed us and created us to live together in community. Our lives as children of God are interwoven with each other. Or as Dietrich Bonhoeffer puts it, the church is Christ existing in community. The gospel does not allow individual forms of believers to exist outside of the church. Christianity means community through and in Jesus Christ. We belong to each other only through and in Jesus Christ. And yes, friends, that's another shameless plug to join our book group on Tuesday. And speaking of the church existing in community, we have a wonderful example right here at Grace this week. 20 people, 15 young adults, and five adult volunteers are right now on their way to the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee as part of our Genesis mission trip. They're worshiping together this morning with a new faith community at a church just outside Nashville. And then later today, they're going to drive up into the mountains where they'll work with people that are in need and find new ways to help these families and to get to learn about them. 
our youth are being the heart, hands, feet, and voice of Christ in the world. And by the end of the week, they'll no longer be strangers, no longer be strangers to each other in their group, and no longer be strangers to the people they're living with and working with in Tennessee. And they will have developed new communities. Friends, please keep them in your prayers this week and thank them when they return. And if you see them over the next couple weeks, ask them how they've been transformed as a result of this trip. I can guarantee you they're going to have some wonderful stories. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King spoke often of beloved community, which he further defined as heaven incarnate on earth. Even though he spoke these words over 60 years ago, they still ring true in our world today. Just watch the news, and these words are still very, very truthful. In the beloved community, poverty, hunger, and homelessness will not be tolerated because international standards of human decency will not allow it. Racism and all forms of discrimination, bigotry, and prejudice will be replaced by an all-inclusive spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. The end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of beloved community. It's this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opponents into friends. Can I get an amen? Amen. People of grace, we're being called today to continue Dr. King's vision and work toward that beloved community, to no longer live as strangers, but as beloved siblings in Christ with everyone, to reach out, to open our arms. Friends, our loving God has bestowed upon us grace upon grace. May we do the same for others. There are no strangers here. Amen.